Hello, welcome to our session on uh, stack repair as part of the series on hyperspace masterclass. Those of you who are joining us live and those of you who are watching this recorded at a later date, we're glad that you're taking a look at this. And we're excited about this talk today. This is a really fun you know, topic to discuss and to share with you some observations that we've learned in our practice really in just the last couple of years. So Dr. Bush here, Dr. Snodgrass, sitting in our Hypospadia Specialty Center in Dallas. And our title is The Game Changer because stack repair is that. It certainly has been for us. It has been for other people who have heard us and started doing it and said, wow, you're right. And we think it will be for you too. We're really excited to share this with you because it just has completely changed our algorithm from the very get go when it comes to hypospadias repair. So for us, a, a small part of our practice is usually the distal hypospadias repairs that most of you guys are doing. We get kind of the opposite, which is really what's allowed us to come to this algorithm because when you see so many patients with the most severe forms of hypospadias, whether they're primaries or redos, you just need something that works and reliably works. That's gonna be even more true for those of you where proximal hypospadias and redos are the smaller portion of your practice. You, you've gotta get reliably good at something that just works. And so I hope that when we take you through this, you'll see why we use it and you'll come to that same conclusion. And this also ties back to the earlier um, sessions that we had on distal hypospadias to stress this point that it, it's not where the meatus is that tells you what operation to do. It's the curvature. So if you have no curvature, whether the meatus is distal or proximal, you can do a tip repair. If you have curvature measuring with a goniometer or protractor, less than 30 degrees, you can do a plication and a tip repair. But if it measures 30 degrees or more, we don't advise that approach, not a tip repair, not a plication, not a single corporotomy, but three corporotomies and a, a, stag, a stack repair. Every now and then we do a stag, but not really. This is our go-to operation, and that's what we're presenting to you today. So let's get started. When it comes to, to severe hypospadias, what exactly are the issues? I mean, we've all seen at? this patient, but I think it's really important for our minds to, to take the families through exactly what those problems are. So one of the first things that we see is, of course, that the opening is in the wrong spot. All right. And that's often where surgeons divert all the discussion to when they're amongst themselves or with the family, and they immediately get distracted into talking about how they're going to do the urethroplasty. Flaps or grass, one or two stages, you know, are you going to fix it all the way or not fix it all the way? And all of those are important issues. But we suggest to you that they're not the most important issue, particularly at the beginning, because we're trying to see this through a different lens and not focus on that. Now, we know that these boys, all of them essentially, or over 80% of them, have ventral curvature that averages 50 degrees. You can see in this boy, there is severe ventral curvature. And we don't spend as much time talking about that. You go to meetings or seminars and all about hypospadias, and it's all about the urethroplasty, and it's minimal about the ventral curvature. But straightening ventral curvature, if you were at our last session, is the foundation that you build the house on. And if you don't lay a good foundation, no matter how pretty a mansion you build on top of it, it's going to crack and it may fall apart. And we see it over and, and we see over. it over and over. 
And then there's this. And so we talked about this with our distal hypospadias repairs. If we think it's important in a distal repair, you can only imagine how important it is when it comes to a proximal patient. So if y'all recall back from our skin management, we're measuring from the bottom of the corona to where the scrotum starts. And, and look at this patient. You've got what? A couple of millimeters oh, there. That. <laughs> yeah, really and, and it's very common that it's worse on the left than it is on the right. You know, so maybe we have six millimeters versus two or three millimeters. But that is a measurement that you really want to think about in your head. And we even describe it to the families, which we'll talk about once we get to the skin reconstruction part of this talk. Yeah, I don't think we can stress too much before we go on that when you look at these boys, this is a consistent finding over and over and over. They don't have penis skin on their ventral shaft or, or certainly a minimal amount. And you can't have a normal penis unless you have symmetry penis skin going on around it. Penis. On Let's a straight penis. Add that in there too. All right, so how do we do this? Well, first and foremost, we've got a straightened penis. We so, talked about that. We'll, we'll briefly review it here. So here we are with the boy with this curvature. And again, the question is, why is it bent? And the answer is not core D. The answer is that the corpora are short, that you have a ventral corporal disproportion. So the ventral corpora is short compared to the dorsal side of it. And people, this is what we saw, we have published this, patients coming to us with failed proximal hypospadish repair, we published that 85% of them had recurrent ventral curvature that was um, uh, average of 50, uh, 50 degrees, and when we looked at, well, what did the first surgeon do to straighten the penis? Well, there was cornea excision and a surprising number of them. And of course that didn't work. And then secondly, there was dorsal plication, which we've all been taught to do. And it doesn't work either as you get over 30 degrees of curvature. And then a fewer number of them had corporotomy and corporal graft, and it worked better but we can't accept failure in a third of the patients. That just is not going to get us to have reliable correction to make a normal penis. Well, especially not when failure means starting all, all over, over again when it comes to the urinary channel, because what good does it do you to make a urinary channel that's this length when you need the urinary channel to be that length? So we discussed all of this in the last session, and we're not going to wade back through all of that again, but we're just going to say if you haven't watched session six on how to straighten the penis, please, there's the link to it. Please go to that and take a look. But this is what we do. That's what's in the previous session. We make ventral lengthening, but with three corporotomies and we don't graft those incisions. And we'll show you that again. So at the beginning of the case, we're gonna peel the urethra down. We've opened the penis, we'll say all this again in a minute, but we've peeled the urethra down. You can see that right here. Here's the urethra to expose the ventral side of the penis. And then when we're doing this in the operating room, Dr. Bush next makes a mark on the shaft where she thinks the bending is. You just kind of pick a spot. And sometimes it's so obvious. You'll, you'll see a little indentation or something along those lines. But when you're doing the artificial erection, water or saline is just kind of pouring out. And, and it's really hard to get that marking pin to not just explode everywhere. So you want to mark it before you start injecting with saline so that your eyes can accommodate to say a few millimeters above, a few millimeters below, or man, we got it just right. Once you know that and you've confirmed where the biggest amount of bend is, then you'll Stop injecting, make your line right through the area where it's most bent, one a few millimeters above that, 
and one a few millimeters below that. And with that, you're going to incise all the way through the tunic albuginea. We've heard talk about people making little superficial cuts or something along those lines. That's not what we do. I don't know if it works. If you're doing that, then you've got to prove to yourself with lots of artificial erections on every follow-up that it does work, but that's not what we do. We go all the way through the tunic albuginea here, all the way through here, all the way through there. And what that does is it releases that tremendous amount of tension that's on the underside so that now the penis is straight. And we're gonna cover that and let the body heal. That really is the entire principle of a stack repair. Well, half of the principle. <laughs> okay, <laughs> finish that. fair enough. So then you can kind of test you lift the urethra back up before you take the tourniquet off and kind of see where it's going to go and then cover what is what is not going to be reached by the urethra with the dartos flap. And usually it turns out that we take that from the right side of the penile skin. So you see that's been put over the corporotomy. We stitch it around the perimeter like that. We've lifted up the urethra now with no tension. This is, you don't stretch this, you just put it up where it goes and make the urethrostomy. So that's gonna vary if you have more of a distal repair with severe curvature. You know, in this circumstance, it's gonna be kind of mid shaft. It's gonna cover maybe two of those corporotomies. When you've got a scrotal or a perineal, you're probably not gonna cover any of those corporotomies with your native urethral plate slash urethra. And then you're gonna take your dartos flap to cover all, all three, three of those yeah. corporotomies. So it, it doesn't really matter how that works out, except that at your next stage, the more urethra you have, the shorter your graft right, needs yes. to be. So it, it's just functionally a little bit easier, but what you don't wanna do is stretch too hard and iatrogenically rebend that penis. So again, last time we talked a little bit about corporotomies, this works in almost every case. And as she's already alluded to, we will check an erection. You'll see, we'll talk about it. We check an erection at the next operation. We check an erection at the next operation. If the boy gets a fistula, we check an erection again. We always recheck, recheck erections. And that's how we know that three corporotomies works in almost every single case. And we've published that a couple of times. So as I say, we confirm that every stage. Now, somebody wants to ask, well, what about erectile dysfunction? We do this in adults, and we don't have a single patient who has complained of erectile dysfunction afterwards. And I started doing this over 20 years ago. So this isn't some new thing. We've been doing it for a long time. So we know these results, that it works and that it's durable. Oh, and it also makes the penis longer. Now, and that's important with these boys with proximal hyperspadies, because all of you know that while their penis is a normal size, it's on the smaller size of normal. So giving them some additional length is of obvious benefit. I mean, if you have, this is not even a real severe proximal hyperspadies, right? The average is 70 degrees, which is here, but, but even 50 degrees, do you want your penis to be this length or do you want the penis to be that length? You know, so you can shorten the long side or you can lengthen the short side. For us, it just seems an obvious thing to lengthen the short side. And really it's that removal of the tension from things that I think is what is most successful. If you're doing it with a single, even if you're lengthening, but you're doing a single corporotomy with a graft, that technically has to be absolutely perfect and you can't have any degree of graft shrinkage or you're bending things over again. We've just kind of removed the thought from it by doing those three corporotomies. Each corporotomy can kind of adjust to where things need to be straight and, and bodies don't want tension on them. They don't want to pull things back over. So that's why it inherently just seems to work. No, it doesn't seem to work. It's proven to work. Fair enough. But of course, there's a downside to everything. So we've done all this, we've straightened the penis, we've made it longer. Oh, but remember there was severe deficiency of the ventral penile skin and we just made that worse. Doctor. So we have to deal with that. And it's important to say up front, we don't use buyer's flap, not the urethroplasty, 
the skin coverage. So we don't just split the, the foreskin down the middle and bring it around to cover it. So can you cover, can you make up for that ventral skin deficiency without doing that maneuver? You can. It, it takes a little bit more work, but you absolutely can do it. And you want to do it because we want every bit of that prep use for their graft. That way you don't have to go into their mouth to harvest things. And you've just got enough beautiful skin coverage that makes it symmetric all the way around. So how do we do that? Well, you'll notice that we never have degloved in this patient at all. Not, not at all. We never make a circumferential incision when we think there's any extent of curvature. So we've taken those dorsal humps and you can see these loops of the stays that we have on there because that's how we're going to lift up on the skin and size it for the penis that's now longer. So you got to explain where those are. So at the very beginning of the um, surgery, we grasp the dorsal hooded prepuce at the 10 and 2 o'clock position and we you know, bring it around to say, is that the right spot? And then we're gonna place a little stay in there. We just do kind of air knots on the same 5 proline that we use through the glands. And the reason why we make those little air knots is because you, you wanna be able to intermittently put a mosquito on there, hemostat, in order to you know, move the penis around. You don't want mosquitoes on there when you're checking erections because it'll pull the skin back and make it more difficult for you to check the erection. You do want them on there and you want to lift them up above the glands where that skin's ultimately going to be when you're harvesting your dartos flap to cover over those corporotomies. Which we'll show you again in a minute. We're just making the point that you open the penis ventrally and so you have skin running along the sides here because you didn't drop it all down and that's what needs to be lengthened. And the way you're going to do all of the dissection that you need to is by extending your midline incision all the way through the dependent aspect of the scrotum. Remember on this case we showed you, you only had this much working room if you just went to the penis scrotal junction, you're not gonna get much dissection there. But by increasing your incision in the midline all the way through the scrotum, now you have this much working room and that allows you to do all of the straightening maneuvers before you even need to begin to think about the skin so that when we are making these cuts in the skin, we can size them for exactly where we want the penis scrotal junction to be tacked and where we want that foreskin to end up above the glands on the ventral surface. Let me orient you for one second on this picture. You notice we haven't made the corporotomies yet in this patient. So the reason we're dealing with this right now is because this skin is so short. You remember this patient at the beginning, the skin is so short that it, you, you can't hardly even stretch it. So we want to release that before we move on. Now, many times we've made the incisions here and this is at the end of the case. And when she said the penis scrotal junction, we incised down through the scrotum, there's the penis scrotal junction right there. And this isn't even showing you the full incision. So this is scrotum and this is penile skin here. And this is what we need to lengthen. And why do we need to lengthen it? You can see that the stay down here is at the level of the glands. We're going to have to pull this skin up so that it oh, is glands. above the glands, which means that we have to release some of this tension right here so that we can do all of the next steps. One thing we used to do many, many, many years ago and have not done in a long time. Well, let's interpret that. One thing I used to do, and she came along and said, you have to stop that. Is to make a cut right along the penis scrotal junction. There's an occasional patient with a severe perineal that the whole penile skin is kind of fused down into the scrotum that you can make that cut through a little bit but you never want to make that cut where it goes back to three and nine o'clock like you used to do. do because you don't need to. And then it's disrupting your blood supply to everything else in the penile skin. And you want as much blood supply there as possible. So you basically just, if you are going to make a cut along the penis scrotal junction, you want to drop that scrotum down 
to where the skin, penile skin, is located at the six o'clock position when you bring all of that together, which you're going to do towards the end of the case. Skin stuff is really hard to discuss. Talk about. We'll hopefully have some more videos as soon as our camera circumstance gets fixed in the operating room so that we can show you each of these little individual components because it varies a lot based on the exact ventral skin anatomy. And so that's why it's not necessarily one size fits all, but we can say, don't cut that back to three and nine o'clock or worse. Which is probably what many of you do is what I used to do. You, you can see that line where the penile skin, you know, fuses to scrotal skin and it just is begging you to cut it. And, and then it's harder to bring that together without making a waste there. So you all know what we're talking about. So now let's not do it that way and tell us what we should do. So what we're going to do is try to get our length more here from where those humps are located on the dorsal surface. Those humps, like we chatted about in the, in the distal repairs, they're a tissue repository. I mean, that's where the majority of your skin is that you want to use. So in this circumstance, the, um, the stay is kind of on the hump, which is in this vicinity. We can cut into it from below. We can cut into it from above, or sometimes you can just make a, a small incision where the skin is most short and that will elongate things. And we actually use all of those at our disposal, depending on exactly where that hump is located and exactly where the urethra is going to go because you've got just a little bit of extra room. We leave a little diamond on that urethral plate and that's gonna help make up some of the difference on that ventral skin. So between the up cut, the down cut or the cutting off all together, we're gonna elongate that skin. And then what we don't do is cut directly into um, where we put those stays, because we can adjust that cut as well to help make up for some of this ventral skin deficiency for the foreskin itself. So we mark it, we use that to stretch our skin to see where the skin is, is the most short and make it oblique cut. We don't do it at a right angle because then you get those narrowed waists. So we make oblique cuts and that really is what's gonna allow your Z-plasty to come together along the front and go from skin that's a few millimeters in length to basically 40 millimeters in length. So that's a very common size discrepancy. We go from 10 to 40 on a regular basis. And the other thing is, when you're doing all this, all of you know this, when you open the skin ventrally on a boy with severe hypospadias, there's not much dartos under it. And so it has that, quote, thin look. Now, she's just taken it. She's stretched it all over the place. She's cut it this way. She's cut it that way and done all that. And it needs time to heal. That alone is a stress on that skin. Think about it. From here to here in some of the very most thin skin on the body. Yeah. I mean, you've got eyelid skin. But it's even more thin because it doesn't have the dark yeah. right? And, and that's just asking that skin to do a lot. And we want to just let it do its thing so that when you're done, you have normal skin. It's kind of thickened and hardened itself up. So the problem is, this is what we've learned in the last couple of years. This is the final thing which pushed us to doing the stack repair as a routine. And that's because even when you can cover the corporotomies with the urethra without tension, so that you're putting graft onto intact corpora, this work that you have to do on the skin adds stress. And then when you put the graft in there, those edges where the skin meets the graft, the graft needs nourishment from the skin and the skin can't provide it. And so you end up with the skin contracting, the graft thickening along there, sometimes scarring along there, and you don't have 
the optimal circumstances for tubularizing that next time. This is absolutely an important part of the whole thing with grass. They get vascularity from the corpora, but they also get it from the adjacent skin. That's true in severe proximals. It's also true in redo operations. And for those of you who are doing single corporotomies and then putting down dermis or SIS or whatever, and then you put this thin skin over it, that's also stressing that skin and it may adhere to that. It won't stretch as much. You don't have optimal skin for later when you're ready to finish making his penis. So when we do all this, like we said, now we've lifted up our corners. corners of the prefuse. We've made some oblique incisions. So in this circumstance, I cut up this direction and down that direction. I offset it so that when we close this, you've got kind of that little bit of a Z shape to it, but, but it allows things to come around because you're using those pumps from the dorsal surface to make up for that midline um, kind of lateral deficiency that you have. And believe it or not, no matter how severe the skin deficiency is, you can make this work. It's just, you gotta work at it a little bit and it's not necessarily intuitive, but um, it's feasible and we haven't had a case except for our very first one where we didn't know any better. We didn't know to do this right here. We just here. left, left it up there. corners because we thought oh, it'll, it'll be okay in this circumstance. And, and basically what happened is that the skin didn't stretch so that we didn't have enough to make the graft the next time around. But by going ahead and completing that propuceoplasty, and making sure that we tack the skin at the penis scrotal junction, three and nine o'clock, we can stretch that skin and it works beautifully in that regard. So now we're gonna put all this together and explain how you do a stack repair. And the, the key thing is this very first operation. So again, we're showing this same patient. This is him. This is a skin incision for him. And you see it's all ventral. When she said the incision goes down in the scrotum, it goes down in the scrotum. There's almost no skin here. If you don't make this incision like that, you, you can't get to everything. And now tell them about this right Yeah, here. so your very initial skin incision is really crucial because you want to make sure that you have enough skin between your corona and where this little wing is so that you can bring that foreskin around. That's going to be three or four millimeters below the, yeah, below the corona. So you can see I haven't extended these incisions all the way out to my stays because I want to be able to adjust that a little bit. But in these kids with really no ventral skin, you, you have to go out laterally just a little bit. And it also makes a difference because the skin is really tethering right here. And so you'll, you'll just need that ability when you're checking your erections and things along those lines, you have to have that little bit of a release. So the, the visual clue there is to go about three or four millimeters below your corona. You can see in this patient, he's actually yeah, not eccentric, even eating, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this right hemi glands is up higher than the left one. So it looks like the skin incision is uneven and the skin incision may be uneven, but you're a, but it's exactly even below that level of the corona. So that's what we do around that initial incision. And we're going to get most of our room for dissection through that scrotal incision. So we've already showed you, you know, we're going to deglove that. We're going to peel the urethra off. We're going to check an erection. We're going to mark the lines. We're going to do the corporotomies, cover that with dartos, make our proximal urethroscopy, all those things we've already discussed and shown. And then we're going to do that perpucioplasty, but also... We're going to tack the penis scrotal junction. 
crucial maneuver that we do each and every step of the way, because every time you're asking for that skin to stretch ventrally, and you have to have a fixation point for it to stretch. All of us have seen those proximal hypospadias patients that look like little volcanoes that, you know, this skin just kind of fat, the, you know, it, it just so doesn't fair. look like a good cylindrical shape. And that's because you have to have those good fixation sutures down at the penoscrotal junction. So we're going to do that each and every time. Every step. So that's a really key point. And again, we didn't do that like the very first patient that we did this procedure on. And so she quickly figured out, not only do you have to save the skin where the post-op erection, remember this penis is bent right here, but now we make it straight. So the post-operative erections have the opportunity to stretch the skin if you close it around the glands and if you tack it here and there so that it will stretch. So those are really key points in getting this right. And what happens when you do this? Six months later, that's what it looks like. Over and over and over again. I mean, the penis looks normal, except you can see the meatus is right there, but there's symmetric penile skin. It is straight. This works almost, almost, every single case. It's dramatic. The parents see it too. They're like, oh, wow, look at that. You don't see this if you try to put your graft at the same time. It just doesn't work that way. And our view is that now that we've made a penis, we just need to put a urethra into it. And all of us can do that. Once you get the penis straight and you have good skin, I mean, look at this. This looks like a completely normal penis, except that the meatus is down there. So now we can make a urethra. Yeah. And the best way to make a urethra is with a two-stage graft. So let's look at that. So we've retracted the foreskin here and we've made a ventral midline incision. Again, we've not degloved the whole penis. We have to break ourselves of that knee-jerk reaction. You walk in, you see a penis on the operating table, you make a circumferential incision and drop the skin. We almost never do that anymore. So you're going to make a ventral incision there. Yep. Because we're going to double check that erection. So we've opened the skin, we've released it and everything. Now we're gonna check the erection and confirm that those three corporotomies worked. And this is how we know that they work in almost every case, right? Yeah. And then we can deglove the penis, but we're gonna do it in a careful fashion. Well, so we deglove under the mucosal collar in the standard portion, except we leave a very short mucosal collar because we want to leave as much of that prep use, both inner and outer, for our graft, that's gonna particularly be true for somebody who's a perineal or scrotal where your graft needs to be four centimeters in length. It's a little less crucial for somebody that you only need a two centimeter graft, but it's nice to do these the same way each and Over every and time. So we've made that midline incision once we proven that the penis is straight. Now we'll make our circumferential uh, incision a few millimeters below the mucosal collar. Usually and it's about four or five, like you see marked here. So but, once, once we make that incision, we've already degloved ventrally. We'll finish that degloving dorsally. And then we're going to peel off the inner prepuce from the outer prepuce. So we'll just carefully dissect off that dartos so that basically you see here, we're lifting that inner prepuce up. But before we make our circumcision, what did we do? Oh yeah, we tacked the penoscrotal junctions again, because if you don't tack, it's very easy to accidentally pull up too much. And you're thinking in your head, I have to get a big enough graft and all of this sorts of thing. But if you pull up too much and you leave them with short skin, that's a way worse problem than if you have to go borrow tissue from the mouth. We don't end up needing to do that, but you know, you can do that, especially if you're on your learning curve, but you can't leave patients with too short a skin. So we retack it and then 
finally, when everything else is all set, the, the skin is unfurled, you've guaranteed that the penis is straight, you've retacked your penis scrotal junction. And then even if the urethrostomy is down here, we actually put a stay, a temporary stay right here at the penis scrotal junction at six, uh, six o'clock on a tag so that again, we've got something kind of pulling that skin down because it's easiest to make it too short right here along the ventral surface. And once all of that is done, now we mark our circumcision and then everything that you don't need for covering the penis skin is gonna be part of your graft. So we're not sizing the graft. We're not marking things for the graft that we need. We're marking things for the skin that we have to have to have a normal looking penis. And then everything else is graft. So you can see we have lots of graft. Look at that. Guess it what? It looks like we there's usually nothing. need four centimeters to go from the tip of a penis to a scrotal location. We don't have four centimeters this way, up and down. We have four centimeters around and it's reliably four centimeters around. So you just have to have enough width, basically between 15 and 20 millimeters of skin this direction. Usually you have more, you can see this is probably 25 millimeters. But, but you only need 15 to 20 this direction. You get usually 40 this direction. And that's how when you tack this penis scrotal junction, when you reconstruct the foreskin, you can reliably have a graft that reaches from the tip of the penis all the way down into the scrotum. Remember, this is the same patient that we started with that had no ventral skin, that little bent over penis. And look at that now. So now, that needs to heal and it heals in almost every patient to give us a healthy graft. And that, I can't tell you how important that is when you go to the final stage tubularization to have a healthy graft. We used to dread tubularizations uh, because we would have so much work to do to get it supple enough to easily bring that around. And that's because we were grafting on top of those corporotomies or we were grafting in a circumstance where they had sick skin. And all of that works to kind of contract things down and make it much more difficult. When you graft onto a smooth surface with good, healthy skin, your grafts are so, so nice. Beautiful. There's like no work to do except for sewing, which is exactly how you want that last stage to be. So here's an example. We're going to look at that and check our margins and make sure everything's good but basically the incision is going to go around that perimeter where the skin and the graft meet and then again down the midline we're going to mark the glands but we're not going to cut the glands yet and then once again like always we're going to deglove and we're going to check a yet another erection and confirm that yep nothing's changed then we're going to do this, what we call an extended dissection of the glands wings. We're gonna, we do this after the artificial erection. So we wanna open it where it's like this. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And because the goal is to have no tension on the glands wings when you bring them together. Now we can roll the urethra and we do this just like a proximal tip. So the first layer is interrupted, subepithelial 7 ovipar suture, interrupted. The second layer is a running layer, and our faces are on the thing. I They're can't not see on the video. Yeah, I know, but I can't see that slide there. Uh, and, but then we're after we've done that two-layer closure, we're going to cover it with tunica vaginalis, not dartos, tunica vaginalis, and then we do a glansplasty, to bring the opening all the way out to the tip, three subepithelial stitches of 6 ovipral. Again, we've taken the tension off, so now it should come together and, and close easily. And then there we go. We have a normal penis in the operating room. And here's our results in the most severe hypospadias. We don't have strictures, we don't have neatal stenosis, we have some fistulas and glands dehiscence. And the fistulas, it's important to say that these are straight penises with supple skin. 
So these are not difficult fistula closures. And the glands dehiss, since we have 80% success reclosing of glands that dehiss after the first operation. So when you look at this- And, have, and these are the smallest glands, which we'll talk about. Yeah, so we have a 15% complication rate, but the final result is nearly 100% success, nearly 100%. Not with a subcoronal meatus. Yeah, so this is this is that patient that we've been following through all of this. This is that patient when he's done. And and there are other patients. This 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 is just this is what we expect to happen. So look at these patients. Look how severe their initial hypospadias is. Look that they all have a penis with the opening at the tip. It looks normal. Oh, it's not just these patients. There's some more. There's just no other way that we are aware of that surgeons can reliably, case after case, of the most severe hypospadias make a normal penis. And that's what these guys want, right? And then there's some additional fringe benefits to that. And what doesn't happen to you when you do a stack? And one is you don't get recurrent penile curvature. And as we said, of the boys coming to us with failed proximal repairs, 85% of them had recurrent penile curvature. So that's not going to happen with this. You don't have to go in the mouth. You don't deal with all these graft contractures and problems. We, like she said earlier, even if we could use the graft, we couldn't just walk in and start tubularizing it. We would spend 30 minutes just nipping at it, making little nicks in it, all kinds of little tricks, just so we could roll it into a tube. And, and that was the that. graft portion. You forget that when a graft Stand. contracts, it kills much of the normal skin around it. So even when you get the urethra together, now you're still struggling to get that skin together. And that's where people end up with Cecil's yeah, or scrotal flap. But you see that right here. I mean, this is a kid with a graft contracture and you can see the skin is longer here and the skin is contracted over there. So, I mean, these are all just excruciatingly difficult problems. And as she just said, you get loss of skin and scarring of it. And so then you end up maybe needing scrotal flaps. That all looks kind of pretty when you do it in a little boy, but those boys grow into men and they do not like this scrotum coming out on their penis and their wives don't like it even less. If they've gotten to the point, point of having girlfriends yeah. to get away. We've done Cecil's in the past when we had skin deficiency, and we haven't had to do any of that since we've gone to stack. And, and even when you do a Cecil, you oftentimes end up having to do a skin graft. And that's just kind of the worst. And you know, if you have to do it, you have to. But by doing all this, we talk so much about the skin. We talked about not doing too much in that first operation letting the penis heal before you put the urethra into it. And wow, all of this, all of this has gone away from our practice. Wow. So I showed this and somebody immediately said, well, but wait, how can you make a terminal meatus when the glass is small? So why don't you answer them? Do we give testosterone to make it bigger? Never. No, never. Never. We tried that. And we've told that story before. I'll just mention it to say, I thought that giving testosterone to grow the glands bigger would take care of the glands dehiscence problem. And we found that it did not. So in this series of boys that we're talking about, that we've done stack on, you see that, um, that like boys with proximal hypospadias, their mean glands width is the 12.7, we published that before. And in this series, the smallest of them started out at 10 millimeters. So these are boys, typical severe hypospadias. And what we learned was that not testosterone, but doing a better glansplasty. So it was a technical problem in how I was doing the glansplasty because I was just opening the glands wings to three and nine o'clock, what I call the tradition. I think many of you were taught that, not all of you, but many of you were taught that. And that just doesn't release the tension. Here, here. 
for a really small glands, it's not enough yeah. to put it together without tension. And when you have tension, that's where you have the problems yes. with it opening. Yeah. So we open it laterally and we bring the, the, the glands off of those corpora so that when we bring it together now, there's much, I mean, you just don't really feel tension even in the smallest 10 millimeter glands that we have. Yeah, so that is releasing the gland swing off the corpus, she said, but it also, we're releasing the mucosal collar out there. It's surprising it's that the mucosal collar at three and nine o'clock is really densely adherent and you have to be right on the corpora or you'll cut into it. And that really gives a lot of this release right at three and nine o'clock. Yeah, it's crazy. It's this tiny little thin skin that's so easy to even just tear with your pickups. If that happens or we cut through it accidentally, we'll use a 9 0 to sew it shut. But that tiny thin skin is really pulling down and offering some tension. So releasing that to all the way three and nine o'clock and up superiorly is what's going to allow those small glands to be closed without tension and heal much better than we ever had in terms of our glands to distance rates in the past. So again, that's what that looks like. We showed a similar picture a few minutes ago in a proximal hypospadias. That's what it should look like right there. And notice that when we showed the results a few minutes ago, again, no meatal stenosis in the series. I mean, we just don't see meatal stenosis. And we think that really, again, is a tension thing. When you have something under tension, it's either going to open up or it's going to scar shut. So all of this has to be tension free. And we do that with our glands dissection and making sure that our skin is healthy. Yeah. We were clearly getting glands to his sense before when our skin wasn't healthy right and we were pulling and working hard to get the skin together that can pull apart your glands. Yeah, that's something else Dr. Bush taught me. I would say, this just feels tight up here. And she would reach all the way down here and say, well, we need to release it right here. And I was just looking at her going, that's crazy. And yet, sure enough, you can feel tension all along here um, in, in many of these cases. And the way to release it oftentimes is not to release. You do all of this, but then you come down here and release the skin as we've already shown. So. That's another concept that was never implanted in my mind in the past, The tension on the skin, tension on the urethra, all of that needs to be avoided. We so, do our same glansplasty that we do with a distal tip, three subepithelial sutures with 6 o and a prepubertal void at the mid glands, one right below that, and at the corona. No stitches through the epithelium. If you're doing that, please stop. It scars the glands. If they have a really small, so less than 13 millimeter glands, the trick is going to a smaller diversion catheter because you don't want tension like we chatted about. So we'll move from our standard six French that we use in all of the other boys or boys with a, a normal size glands for, for distal hypospadias, that average is, is over 14 millimeters. Those get a six French. If they're smaller, you wanna make sure you're not providing any tension. So we go down to a five French thumb. And we use feeding tubes for our diversion catheters. Is it worth three stages? Well, I'm the one who's old enough and some of you watching are old enough to remember the truth of this statement that I can't tell you how many meetings I was at where the question would come up of doing a two stage versus a one stage repair. And good old Howard Snyder was reliable to go to the microphone and make this comment that, well, if half the patients had a complication after one stage repair, the other half were spared an additional operation. And the problem is that now that we know the real results of those one stage repairs, the majority of them are two or more operations. It's not half of them, it's more than half of them. It's nearly all of them. And we also know from recent publications from, from centers that actually looked at their virus flaps outcomes and then honestly reported them that the two-stage operation is really a three-stage operation in the majority of patients are more 
And the same thing with BRCA, the two-stage BRCA. Remember, we talked about this in the past, that he didn't straighten the penis with corporotomies in boys with severe hypospadias. He did cordy excision and sometimes a, a dorsal plication. So if you don't straighten the penis, then you're not going to have a successful repair and you're going to end up again needing three or more operations. And the point is that redos for complications are not the same as planned staged repairs. And we were looking at this this morning and she added, but you didn't put in here about the, what it does to the skin. That's the biggest issue. If you don't straighten the penis correctly, or if you have contracture because you put a graft over corporotomies or something along those lines, when you end up with this, you end up with short skin. Again. Again. But now you have no foreskin. So you don't have your tissue repository to make it look normal. And it is such a struggle for these folks to make a normal looking penis that heals healthily when you have half the skin you need on the undersurface of the penis compared to the dorsal surface. And that's even worse when they're circumferentially short, which we also see in redo circumstances. You know, when people were trying to use all of the foreskin possible with the TI to bridge a long gap, and now they're short everywhere, it's a disaster. There's no skin on the body that's like penis skin. And if you don't have good penis skin on the outside of the penis, you're not going to have a normal looking, normal functioning penis. So fail surgery equals really failed skin. And that is very difficult to overcome in reoperations. So I tell folks all the time, when it comes to breast cancer, they don't take out your cancer and fix the skin and put it together and put in your you know, prosthesis or your reconstructed breast and make a nipple at the same time. <laughs> because no, they're not your Nobody does that. <laughs> and if they did, what's gonna happen? It's gonna be a disaster. wide open disaster, right? They do the cancer surgery, they let it rest. They come back and they make the breast, they let it rest, then they make the nipple. And, and it's expected with major reconstructive surgery that you have to let bodies heal and have a little bit of time before you move to the next step. And that's all we're saying that when it comes to the most severe hypospadias cases that there are, do something and then let it rest. Because this is the bottom line. The penis has to be straight. Because if you don't, we've said a couple of times, you get a very high urethroplasty complication. And the next time you're in your office and you see a boy you did a proximal pair on and he has a fistula or glands dehiscence, please, when you go to the operating room, check him for ventral curvature and don't do application if you find it. And we also have to remember, it doesn't take much curvature. What if you manage to heal the penis? You manage to get the urethra out and, and all of that heals without an obvious complication. That's how much curvature it takes to get sexual dysfunction. And that's not much. That's the picture from the, the, study. the study where they asked guys who had penises, whether they were straight or not, Folks who declared they had that much curvature reported higher sexual dysfunction than folks who had a straight penis. So it has to be straight, not almost straight. And then the meatus has to be at the tip. It is not acceptable to bring the meatus up to the corona or the proximal glands and say, well, that's as good as we can do. Because remember, we started out a long time ago on the first on the very first of these sessions that we did that a normal penis has four millimeters of glands fusion from the meatus to the corona and when you have less than that then you end up with spraying and we've documented that in a couple of series of adults that we presented you know virtually at the last day you weigh and one of these papers is uh, in review and the other one we're about to submit so the fact is that abnormal anatomy creates abnormal function and that translates into spring and that's a real problem for teens and adults who have it and 
and it doesn't look normal when the opening is down low and everything is red and weird looking and in there. It doesn't look normal in that direction. And it doesn't look normal when the skin isn't right and when the penis is still bent. Guys want to look normal. And so in these series of men, one of those series is men with uncorrected distal hypospadias. And the other one is just series of men with complications after their childhood repair. And in both of them, the majority of those patients came to us primarily because of urine spraying. But then they also said, oh, and by the way, doctor, I'm really unhappy with the way it looks. Almost half of them, that was a second strong motivating factor in wanting to get fixed. Because the bottom line is that everybody, every man, wants to have a normal penis. And that includes boys born with hypospadias. That includes boys born with the most severe hypospadias. They don't want kind of an almost penis. They want a normal penis. They certainly don't want a short, stumpy penis covered in scrotal. No. And this is just what we found. I mean, I, my journey started with transverse islands, went to buyer's flats, went to overextended tip repairs, went to BRCA two-stage repairs, went to STAG repairs, and finally, finally arrived at STAG. And it's just incredible the difference that this operation makes that all those other ones did not achieve. So you here we are. See some? We, yeah, do we do them every day. Every day. So, yeah, come visit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, come visit, email us you know, look for this on the YouTube uh, channel, et cetera. Uh, we are more than happy to share what we know and the resources that we have and all that with you. And we do welcome you to come and spend, if you come spend a week with us, you'll see all of these various steps in both primary and redo surgery. And then we'll close by saying, what's the next session gonna be? So next month, we're gonna tackle this discussion about boys with severe hypospadias do they have ambiguous genitalia? Do they have a micro penis? So you'll want to look forward to that and join us then. In the meantime, we are going to start answering some of your questions that we have. If you have them, you can uh, put them on the chat or on the question and answer, and we'll start um, going through them. Let's see. Have you ever put oral mucosa graft if there is not enough prep use? Um, the one patient that we didn't save and the very first patient, patient that we didn't reconstruct the foreskin for that patient we had to do an oral graft i think not had, but let's emphasize not an entire oral graft we if we would still you always have some prep use so we would take that and put it in the glands yeah. down the shaft as far as it would reach and then take lift and fill from there down to the urethrostomy. And in but, more than 50 patients, we've had two that um, contracted their skin after their stack. So remember, we're going from this to that. It usually shrinks a little bit. Um, Nasser asked last time about some of these patients after stack looking like they have a little bit of bend. And that's generally from that little bit of skin flap contracture. When you release that skin, then they're almost always straight. But we've had a couple that had enough skin contracture that we spent the next surgery fixing that skin again. And then those very small percentage of, of patients that really contract their skin so severely that we've needed to do a skin reoperation, they're going to get hyperbaric because something is a problem. So that's been two out of more than 50 yeah, of, patients. I'm sorry to interrupt. One of those boys not only had ventral curvature, but he had penile torsion. And you know, you don't see penile torsion very much in, in proximal hypospadias, but when you do, oh my gosh, neon signs should be going off because their vascularity of their skin is not normal. The other ones that are really hard are the ones that have a single dorsal hump. It looks like a yeah. like a dwarf hat. Most kids Does anybody know what a dwarf hat is? You know those little <laughs> nose that you put in your garden. I don't know. You got those hats and it looks like that to me. I don't know what else to call them. When you see those be scared because those are the worst 
worst, worst ones to have to reconstruct their skin because you, you need skin on both sides and you only have a midline hump that's going to yeah, come on to go. one side and it's going to leave you short on the other side. Those are really, really difficult to deal with. So I don't know. Maybe and yet despite class, that, here's the in this series, I mean, you know, this series right now, we have follow-up in 45 patients. We, we've done many more than that, but, you know, it takes a year and a half to complete these repairs. So um, we, we've only had a couple of patients and only one we've had to go get oral mucosa. So let me say that again. Many, many of you are looking at proximal hypospadias now and just assuming you're going to make the urethra out of oral mucosa and you don't need to. But the reason that happens to you is because you deglove circumferentially, yep, you drop the skin down, you can't do that. You won't have foreskin. And then you, you do the buyer's flap thing to cover the ventral skin. And then, yeah, you're not gonna have enough. So we don't, we don't do that as we said. How do you explain recurrent penile curvature? Well, that'll be in our reoperation series, which we will- Coming up in another couple of months. Yep. But, but I mean, the bottom line is recurrent penile curvature can be just because the skin contracted. So when you do a stack, we tell all the patients, you may see, we made the penis straight. You may see a little bit of bending post-op and that'll be because the skin's contracted. But when you release the skin curvature that's there, is corporal curvature. And if you did a cordy excision, you didn't address that. If you did a dorsal plication, just we like to tell people this, this is great when you're doing a telemedicine, you look at the wife and you look at the husband and you say, imagine taking an erect penis and bending it 30 degrees. And they're like, you can't do that. Then you go, now imagine taking a penis that's bent 30 degrees and pulling it straight and putting a stitch in and then having that hold it from now on, it doesn't work. And the same thing we've said about this, the single ventral corporotomy. I mean, a penis that's bent 90 or 110 degrees, one incision, even if you, you, you open it as much as you can and all, it just may not be enough. So you get recurring curvature because you didn't fix it right the first time. Yeah. All right, there's a question. Are there potential issues with compromising the dorsal blood supply with three corporotomies and extended glansplasty, especially if the dorsal plication and degloving is done as well? And we cannot answer that. Because we don't do that. Because we don't do that. We have in the past with stags done three corporotomies and um, opening up the glands and most of the time that works, but then you, you in terms of not having a blood supply issue to the glands, I guess I would say, because we have that series where we didn't see glands volume loss. So yeah, you can do that, but you're much better off doing smaller bits at a time because in those circumstances, something affected the blood supply to the skin and to the grafts in a fair number of those boys. I can't answer exactly what or where. But making three ventral corporotomies is not going to impact your dorsal blood supply. It's not the corporotomy that would do it. It's the skin dissection and all of that. And, and if, what you did for your dorsal right. plantation that could potentially impact right. that. It, you know, I was taught that the more the ducket approach where you lifted up the neurovascular bundle and put your plication stitches there rather than in the midline. And so the bottom line is, and let me emphasize this, we've said this before in some other lectures, you can't watch this and then pick and choose the steps that you feel comfortable in doing. It doesn't work that way. So if you don't feel comfortable to do these through a ventral incision and not deep love and all that, then it's just not gonna work. And we can't answer the question about, well, it didn't work. We're like, well, you didn't do it the way that we know how to do it. All okay, right, we have a question it. about um, the, the dressing that we use after mm -hmm. our first stage, and, and that's a good one. We um, now do a little gentle compression dressing. We do an adaptic um, that we wrap around it. If the 
um, meatus of the, of the proximal urethrostomies at the penis scrotal junction, then we'll just wrap out here. If it's in the mid shaft, you know, for a more distal but badly bent patient, then we'll wrap the adaptic a little above and a little bit below. And then we very gently put a coban um, around that. We use the one inch coban um, that will circle around that, leaving some extra coban laterally. So we kind of pinch it flat at the three and nine o'clock positions as we wrap around so that it's not too compressive. And then, especially if you have a low penoscrotal urethrostomy, that whole conglomeration of your adaptic and coban can just pull off the penis, and then you don't have anything that's going to be covering those corporotomies. So actually, we'll use a little tegaderm to just secure that on the backside so that it doesn't lift straight off. And then we'll do our usual dressing with four by fours and tegaderm on top of all of that, because you like to have that little bit of compression. They, we, we haven't experienced major bleeding issues when the bandage gets kicked off by the baby the day of surgery or the next day, which sometimes happens, you know, but if you do have some bleeding under the skin, it can make skin healing more difficult. You'll get that superficial necrosis of the skin, et cetera, or they can get a scrotal hematoma and then you get lots of phone calls because of that. So we like to avoid those. And so that's how we do that with the bandage. The next question is about redo and glands class and all that. And again, that's a whole topic and we're going to discuss it. The bottom line is that in most cases, even in redos where there's been glands damage, we can still do a glands plasty around the urethra. There is the occasional void where so much damage has occurred that it's just technically impossible to do it. And, you know, somebody did that to that child. A surgeon did that to that child. So, our, one of our goals in doing this whole masterclass is to say how we individually do the steps of these operations is critical to their outcome. And we can do tremendous harm of lifelong implications. When you have killed off part of the glands, you cannot bring it back to life. And so our whole goal, again, we said it every session, is do it right the first time. And that's why with severe hypospadias, doing it right the first time is a three-step process. Because it's that way with killing off part of the glands that you cannot that compensate place. for. And it's that way with external penis skin. You can get it kind of close with skin grafts and things along those lines, but they're gonna be hair bearing, the color and the texture aren't gonna be quite right. They're more sticky to the, so you, you've got to protect penis skin and you have to protect the glands at all costs. You can make a urine channel out of other stuff, but those things are the most critical components. So great question. Still a couple more. The next one is what's the normal length of glands fusion? So I think our first and second sessions will talk about that. It's our, it, the goal and, and what we almost always achieve is four millimeters. For those 10 millimeter glands, the tiniest ones, it'll often be three millimeters. Anything more than two, two and a half or above is within a normal range. So all of that is good. So sometimes you'll get a three millimeter glands for your smallest and, and three is fine. Like she said, three works in, in a child. All right, how far apart do I space the corporotomy incisions? Is there a standard distance? And the answer is pretty much yes, uh, because we measure it. So when we have those three lines, we always measure how far apart they are. And it's almost always in a pre patient, 10 millimeters. The whole, the whole thing. The whole line. So each mark is about a millimeter thick. So basically your middle line, your first one's gonna be about four, maybe five millimeters above that. And your one below it is gonna be four, maybe five millimeters above that. The rare exception to that is if you have a patient with a really long penis that has a long arc of a bend instead of a more acute bend, we'll sometimes space those corporotomies a little further apart because it's a long penis and, and you can do that. And of course, in a pubertal or adult patient, those are gonna be different measurements. But for the vast majority of the prepubertal patients, when you measure where those three marks are, it's going to be about 10 millimeters. From the distance from the, to the proximal. That's right. And then when you make your incisions and you straighten them, this is where it gets really fun. Yeah, measure because again. <laughs> you can remeasure it. And what you'll see is that it's a function of how bent the penis is and how acute that bend is. So, you know, the body just kind of knows if you have 
40 degrees of curvature, your increase between your top corporotomy incision line and your bottom corporotomy incision line, maybe seven millimeters or so. When you have 120 degrees of bend, you're going to see at least a 15 or even more increase because those corporotomies open more, the more bent the penis is, but they almost always start around 10 millimeters for even more minor degrees of curvature, if you can call 40 or 50 degrees minor, your, your increase is gonna be about seven millimeters. So you'll go to about 17. And if you have more severe curvature than that, you should be going to at least 20 millimeters after you open those. So those are good clues when you're first starting to do three corporotomies of am I doing them correctly? All right, I think that's all of those questions. Oh, we have a few more on the question and answer. Um, somebody wants to share some of his stack repair, so that's perfect. Please do that. You can um, send them to us on the hypospadiology uh, listserv. Penis scrotal fusion appears to be a common skin feature in proximal hypospadias. Therefore, I thought separating along the penis scrotal junction was an important part of skin yeah, management. I, I used to think that exact same thing. <laughs> and, 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 you know, really, I mean, it just makes sense when you're looking at it, as I said before, I mean, it's like there's a dotted line, a perf you know, you, you could just tear that and you need to lengthen it. And I routinely made the incisions from three to nine o'clock, as she said, but then sometimes it was hard to bring that together. And, and it's not the best way to do it. You get one bit of change when you do it at, at the same place on each side. You notice what she said, was she did, we showed you one side of the skin, but she's gonna do a similar lengthening on the other side of the skin. And, and if she went up on this side, she tends to go down on this side and vice versa. And so you get some incremental increases on both sides that then when you close it together, you have a Z plastic. So I'm gonna say that, that Milan, there are two different types of penis scrotal fusion. The most common that we deal with really isn't an issue where the actual penile skin is fused down to the scrotal. That happens, but it's usually in only the most severe perineals that have a huge cleft in them. Then you actually will have penile skin literally fused to the scrotum. And yes, on those, you have to release that, that penis skin to help give you length. But that is a very small percentage of the most severe forms of hypospadias. The vast majority don't have fusion down in the scrotum. They have scrotum that's lifted up. And so in those, you're, you're going to just be dropping the scrotum down by internally releasing the penoscrotal attachments that actually kind of fuse up to that penopubic junction. So we do that not by cutting the skin externally, you can leave all that external stuff intact, but by dropping the tethering penoscrotal things that, that go all the way up to the penopubic junction, we'll cut those internally to drop that down. And then you leave your penoscrotal junction intact and deal with the rest of the skin for shortening more in the mid shaft or out in those dorsal hump regions. So the, yes, you, you can need to release it in a few, but, but those are only the few where literally the, the penis itself is fused down to the scrotum. And I haven't looked at the number, but I would say that's less than 10% of our most severe proximal cases. The next question is similar to one that we already I answered. We answer or maybe that. we did answer yep. it again, this question about, but I wanna stress one more time, Corporotomies do not impair dorsal blood supply. They are ventral incisions in the tunica albuginea that don't go past three and nine o'clock. In fact, they, they go up just to three and nine o'clock. And, and then we, we don't do degloving. And we almost never do application in these boys because, uh, you know, curvature that's 30 degrees or more is just not well 
treat it that way. We used to when we wanted to have redundant systems and it was easy when we'd done our circumferential incision. We stopped doing it a long time ago when you only eventually deglove because it's a real pain to get back there. You can do and, it, but. Yeah, you can, but we just have found that we don't need to. And, and I guess a, an added bonus to that would be we wouldn't have the risk of you know, dinging of an artery that was going back through that, that neurovascular bundle on the dorsal surface. So. so thanks for your questions. Thanks for your attention. Again, you can email either of us through the addresses that we showed on the slide. Uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube before the end of the weekend, probably, or early next week, depending on when Dr. Bush gets around to it. And so you can look forward to watching again there. So again, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you again in a month for the next session. Bye. Bye.